good conversation, unabashedly Wisconsin. This is Up North News Radio. Now, live from Chicago and the Democratic National Convention, here's the founding editor of Up North News, Pat Bredlow. All right, thank you, Don Rue, and welcome back to the second hour of Up North News Radio for this Tuesday morning, August 20th. Day two of the Democratic National Convention from here in Chicago. Greg Bach is back in Waukesha, and meteorologist Brittany Merlot is with us as well. And uh, Brittany, good morning. How are you? Good morning. I'm great. How are you doing? Well, I'm fine. I'm a little intrigued, though, about the the side conversation that I was catching right before we we came out here. <laughs> and uh, it was apparently movie night with with Greg and the puppy. Oh, yeah. Um, and felt the, felt the need to update you on... Was it Lady and the Tramp? Yeah. First of all, this is my dog, Maybell. Oh, look oh. at that photo. My goodness. She is very photogenic. <laughs> You'll be like, Maybell, she'll be like, yes. Where's the, <laughs> which camera am I looking at? But That's we, funny. so we were watching Lady and the Tramp last night, and she was, I don't have a good picture. It doesn't matter. Um, she was kind of <laughs> losing her mind with all the dogs. Like, she was like jumping up on the fireplace, like, what's going on here? And barking. We're just like, Oh my God! <laughs> Had Maybell not been exposed to dogs on TV before? I mean, yeah, we actually when we like if I'll leave her in the crate for a long period of time while I'm at work and she's relaxing and it's all above board. People, don't get mad at me. Um, I'll actually turn on there's these YouTube videos of like ten hours of relaxing music for dogs and it's showing dogs on the screen and Aww. she never has a problem with it. But then again, they're also not barking and they're also not talking dogs either so oh <laughs> see that's the thing that's where she's like wait a minute where do i get these lessons i want to speak english <laughs> trust me right? I, wish she, I wish she would sometimes <laughs> uh, rob wishes us a good morning from tigerton saying it is sunny and 48 degrees a busy day of mowing in wittenberg today i had a fun trip to wausau ate at rocky rococo's uh off of Rib Mountain Drive. I would love to take you to pizza there. Happy National Radio Personality Days to Aww. my favorite radio personalities at Civic Media. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Rob. Thanks, Rob. Drink yeah, well, water. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and like, who are we kidding? He's talking about Brittany. It's, I mean, she's she's the fave. She, she brings us really nice weather forecasts, uh, don't Especially you? No, no, no pressure there, Brittany. Did you bring us a nice weather forecast? Oh, yeah. This week I've got you. Definitely got you this week. No bad news out there. (laughs) Yes. Okay. Wait here. There is a little bit of a bad news. We'll start with that so we can end with the good stuff. The bad news is the allergies are going to be high. Ragweed is off the charts throughout the entire state today. So keep that in mind. But otherwise, high pressure system has built in. It has calmed our winds down and it's also cleared our skies. Right. So we're going to be bright and beautiful all day today barely a cloud in the sky, and high temperatures will be cooler. We're actually going to reach highs in the upper 60s to low 70s. The further east that you live in the state and the further west that you live, you're going to be closer to the mid-70s. So this is, of course, below average. Nice, dry, comfortable air mass here. But if you're by Lake Michigan, keep in mind that there is still a beach hazard statement in effect until 1 o'clock this afternoon. Those waves are about three to five feet high, and they had water rescues yesterday. I think it was five people that were rescued from Lake Michigan. So not only the waves, but the rip currents. Just keep away from the lake for today. Oh, my goodness. Yes. I mean, that that is nothing to mess around with. No. Uh, powerful. I, and it could yeah. change in minutes, too. Right. So don't use it as a swimming pool. Not a No. Day. No. This, uh, <laughs> heed the warnings, always. Brittany Merlot, thank you so much. Have a great start to your day. Thanks. You, too. All right, we uh, the Up North News Daily newsletter comes out early every morning. Christina Laurie puts that together for us. And uh, today, it includes uh, my story on taxing tips and a, a little bit of a history lesson and a reminder about perspective. Uh, Donald Trump has talked about lifting taxation on tips, something that was started in the Ronald Reagan administration, by the way. Uh, Kamala Harris has also talked about um, eliminating or reducing or reforming taxes on tips. Donald Trump said, oh, well, she's just copying me. Uh, No, 
<laughs> the details are going to be widely different uh, depending on, on who wins. In one case, you would see actual relief to uh, the women and men who work in the service and hospitality industries. And in the other case, you would probably see a whole lot of, uh, you know, hedge fund managers get paid uh, $1 in salary and then a lot of it coming in tips, seven figures worth of tips. So again, look for the details of what they're promising. Uh, you'll find out more in our daily newsletter. Sign up for it over at upnorthnewswi.com. The Milwaukee Brewers were off yesterday. They are in St. Louis to take on the Cardinals for a three-game set. Starting at 7.10 this evening, the pregame is at 6.35 on Civic Media Stations in Richland Center, in Racine, Kenosha, in Park Falls, and in Oshkosh. Uh, the Brewers have managed to overcome all sorts of injuries and adversity uh, the AP had a, a story on it today saying this was expected to be the season. The Brewers finally took a step back after making five playoff appearances over the last six years, but that hasn't happened. Even after losing Craig Council, even after losing Corbin Burns, uh, Milwaukee has the largest lead in the major leagues right now of all the division leaders. An 11-game lead over the St. Louis Cardinals after winning five straight. Uh, they will uh, be in St. Louis, as mentioned earlier. They currently have a 6-1 and one series record against uh, the Cardinals. Not a typical year for baseball. The, the, the Cardinals are as bad as they've been in a very, very long time. Uh, the Brewers continue to impress and amaze and surprise. And so we'll see how you know that all plays out for them coming up in a series that starts tonight. Let me get away from the political convention talk just long enough to make mention of the, the passing of a, of a talk show uh, legend. And that, of course, would be Phil Donahue, who uh, passed away at the age of 88 years old yesterday. Uh, he, he was it. He was it for the, the 70s and 80s for talk shows between uh, before Oprah Winfrey came along in the mid-1980s. And uh, I'm not going to say that he was a, a maybe a direct inspiration, but how could you not appreciate and want to emulate some of the example that he set for his points of view, his candor, his ability to ask an hour's worth of questions and make them all interesting, make you want to hear what the guest had to say. And then there was the running around with the microphone, uh, bringing, bringing the audience in. I mean, for Greg and I, I mean, if, if, if we're going to bring people in, they're going to call 855-75-CIVIC and we're going to check out, you know, what they want to say and we're going to put them on the radio. For a TV show, you have to go running all around the studio audience with with a thank God for wireless. <laughs> and that man's cardio game was on point. Yes, and and getting people in, and I I I don't even know that I can remember. You know, we we, we have end up screening callers quite a bit because yeah. um, some some folks are just uh you know it's they're, it's weird. They're precious they're, moments. Just look at yeah, just look at Twitter as an example, but it was a it was a simpler time back then, and I don't recall any instances where where Phil Don he was like, no, you need to leave. You know, you're <laughs> that was a stupid question, or yeah. you know, he disagree with them, but did it in a in a in a very nice way, nice but direct. And I mean, that was that was the guy that you know you wanted daytime talk to be. It was fun to look back at the clip where he had actress Marlo Thomas on and watch them just immediately. You could tell they were both just falling for each other, and they ended up being married for over 40 years. I, which, I love um, that. It was really it – was, it was wonderfully romantic. And look, he, Phil Donahue also, much like Johnny Carson, when – you you understood that you know the, the string had, had had run out and things had run their course. Um, when he stepped back, he didn't really step back in at all. He said, uh, "Look, I've done this. The grind of a talk show is really something. It takes a toll. When you're done, you want to be done." And he was. He went went and had a very enjoyable retirement. And he retired. For, I mean, like he, that show lasted until what, like the early '90s? Yes, maybe. Yep. I mean. You think about that. He's been pretty much out of the spotlight for 
30 years 30 years right and yeah the, the he had a way of asking tough questions making the person feel safe while answering them but then also calling them out when he felt like they were giving a a not so great answer either and it's just yeah see and that's the thing he he had plenty of guests in there that he disagreed with vehemently mm -hmm. but he he put them on camera he put them on stage and then would ask questions in a way that we're not necessarily meant to tear them down or embarrass them, but challenge them. Yeah. And when it was all said and done, what you noticed was a lot of respect mm -hmm. that, that a guy like Phil Donahue could do that, could essentially hold up a mirror and he doesn't have to call somebody, you know, an ugly Nazi or something. Yeah. You just know by the end of the show, you're like, this guy's an ugly Nazi. Yeah. And he was yeah. given a fair forum by Phil Donahue and proved that he was, you know, nothing but, or, or whatever the case may be, given some of the guests. Now he did have, um, you know, it was TV. Uh, TV is a, is a profit driven. And there were definitely times, you know, where the, the topics were offbeat or some would say sensational. And the thing that I think that um, most folks and uh, people are going to, are going to, be all mad at me that they think I'm taking shots at Oprah here. Uh, Oprah has done a lot of amazing things with her career, but I feel like people have, have kind of lost track that the way Oprah Winfrey caught up with and overtook Phil Donahue was she went for some of those, shall we say, splashier, trashier, more tawdry topics, more likely and, and more frequently. And it's what, you know, it what brought eyeballs over. Um, but o Oprah over time, you know, really kind of, how do you want to say Re refined, uh, understood that she had a voice mm -hmm. to help women feel empowered, that she uh, became much more of, of an advocate for her audience yeah. rather than somebody that was chasing ratings. You know, when she realized her popularity, she finally, she said, I'm going to put the people who need to be I put people on camera who need to be on camera, the books, the music, the, 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 I mean, we didn't call them influencers back then, but like the people who yeah. are really influencing tastes as well as, you know, social justice advocates and, and yeah, taking the, went from sensationalism to really having a voice. And that was really like, I think what Donahue did, he wanted to put the best people on TV to get information out there and to inform the public. That's what your job is. Yeah. And, and he took that, uh, very seriously. And, uh, again, will be missed, but, uh, you know, deservedly saluted for uh, a, a wonderful groundbreaking career in broadcast TV. A uh, little later on this hour, we're going to play back uh, plenty of audio from the Democratic National Convention, especially some of the women who had very important and key remarks. But coming up next, we'll play an excerpt from President Joe Biden from his remarks last night. That's after this. You're up north. Robert Plant has a birthday today, 76, I believe, um, for the uh, legend of song. As we're live from Chicago here on Up North News Radio, I, I was, as I've been looking for, for clips to play from the Democratic Convention, I just have to say, and I, I know it's been said a lot, but what Elon Musk has done to Twitter that he now calls X, I mean... Calling it a dumpster fire is an insult to dumpster fires. Uh, <laughs> that, that used to be such a source for people that were putting up, you know, little short newsy clips of things so that they can comment on them. And if you were to put up, just put search for any of, you know, the speakers yesterday, Jill Biden, Ashley Biden, AOC, the stuff that comes up now in your feed is so overwhelmingly garbage. <laughs> um, and you, you just, you want to be so hopeful in humanity that a lot of these are just bots and trolls mm -hmm. and things like that. And that these aren't actual human beings putting up these things that either show that they are this vile or this angry or this gullible when they're posting things that are, you know, have been, proven not to be true but they don't want them to be untrue you're hoping that they're not yeah. but i digress <laughs> <laughs> and that right there is pat's take on x formerly twitter 
Oh my god! I just, I don't it's disagree. Just so it's just so bad. Um, and it, it's it's too bad because and and it's at at its best, it served as um, you know, the old teletype machines in newsrooms. It was mm-hmm. just a constant ticker of useful information. Yeah. And and now it's it's just nothing like that. Uh, did you did you see the last clip I sent, which is an excerpt from uh from President Biden? From I last did. Night? I got I, all of them lined up, ready I, to go. I, I, did manage to find that one, so we'll we'll do uh, we'll do President Biden in this segment, and then we've got uh, four different women who spoke uh, during the convention last night, and we'll do them uh, coming up uh, next time around. But for for President Biden, of course, you know this was a this was a bittersweet moment, a, you know rather rather melancholy for him, uh, somebody who expected to be accepting the nomination to run again, and wouldn't blame him at all for feeling a, a little bit pushed out. And yet at the same time, he's the guy that picked Kamala Harris. And so as a result of that, he has the confidence of knowing that he's doing something that, you know what, we don't see in a lot of workplaces. The The term they use is succession planning, where you basically accept that, look, you're not the only person that can do this. And when you're done, is there going to be some continuity in the job? Do you have a good person that you're training to come up behind you? And I'm not saying Kamala Harris needs training, but somebody that is capable of doing the job, as opposed to say, you know, when Donald Trump first walked into the White House and you know started throwing things, throwing ketchup at the walls. So in President Biden's remarks, you heard somebody that again wanted to make the case of his accomplishments in office. And of course, they were numerous. But he also wanted to make the case that if if he is going to step aside, if he's going to put country before personal ambition and party, that he's handing off to somebody who has earned the trust of Americans. Here's a, a little bit of the uh, excerpt of President Biden's speech at the Democratic National Convention last night. Folks, I've got five months left in my presidency. I've got a lot to do. I intend to get it done. It's it's been the honor of my lifetime to serve as your president. I love the job, but I love my country more. I love my country more. And all this talk about how I'm angry at all those people who said I should step down. That's not true. I love my country more, and we need to preserve our democracy. In 2024, we need you to vote. We need you to keep the Senate. We need you to win back the House of Representatives. And above all, we need you to beat Donald Trump. And elect Kamala and Tim. So again, he he understands that there's there are real threats to democracy in Donald Trump. And it's not a case of, you know, people would say, oh, well, you know, tell us what you're for, not against. I say that all the time. Mm -hmm. He's made that very clear what he's for. He laid that out well in advance of saying, oh, and by the way, you know, Donald Trump remains a threat to democracy in this country. So it was rather well-rounded that way. But again, Greg, like I said, last hour, it was so late. Yeah. It was so painfully late. It was uh, 11. Like you're seeing the thing on here, the time is it was 11 o'clock when he was talking. Yes. You know, so, I mean, it's, and it's, it's midnight out East, you know, yeah. although I, I have to admit that of uh, some of the social posts, I, I loved seeing uh, some of Biden's either supporters or just other pundits ripping into people who we're saying it's too late. It's too late. Like, wait, aren't you guys the same people that were making jokes about Joe Biden's bedtime? Yeah. And now you're the now you're the snowflakes who don't want to stay up so yeah. late to hear a speech. You know, maybe, maybe you should think twice 
you know, before you make uh, comments like that. But it it was it was long, but it was good. And we'll, like I said, play uh, several clips from some of the women who spoke coming up. Uh, and then uh, tonight will be former President Barack Obama, former First Lady Michelle Obama, um, Illinois Governor J.B. Pritzker will be talking as well. Second gentleman, Doug Emhoff. Second gentleman, Doug! one of the one of the greatest job titles ever created, you know, yeah. that didn't exist before. Yeah. Like, what 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 are we going to call this guy? <laughs> um, we call him the first Doug Pat. That's what we call him. The first Doug. That would that would totally work for me. Uh, so we'll, we'll we'll hear that, of course. And then Wednesday we get the remarks from uh, Tim Walls and also from former President uh, Bill Clinton. And then uh, finally on Thursday we get the acceptance speech from Kamala Harris. Now there. There were some uh, demonstrations uh, here in Chicago yesterday. There is, uh, shall we say, a a robust police presence all <laughs> over the city. <laughs> um, but but also because you know there there were plenty of demonstrators out there, primarily on the topic of of Gaza. But I've got to say, not not even for a moment did anybody have any reason to you know not feel safe here this is a city that is so used to tourists is so used to conventions and uh, definitely has the has the apparatus to handle these kinds of things in a city by the way where you know the other 90 percent of folks are just trying to get to work <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah great you're I here just, democracy is great i gotta work i gotta get to work all right move, gotta, move, move. Yes. i gotta get, get on the pizza. bus Ugh. yeah what, what you know but also all kinds of all kinds of uh, uh, retail uh, mm -hmm. shopping and eating here. I was I was so proud of myself when when my train got to Union Station, and as I was going through, I, I took a little video that I'm put up later, uh, sarcasm intentional, going I I found it I found the Chicago <laughs> pizza that we're all everybody's talking about Chicago pizza, and uh, I just know when I put that video up of a Sabaro, people some people are not going to get the, they're not going to get the joke, and I'll, no. I just I no. just feel bad because you're a comedic bad for genius, them. Pat. <laughs> I wouldn't say that, uh, Michael Scott said the Sabaro joke better than any of us about New York pizza. I'm just merely following in his footsteps. More from the convention after this. You're up north. Let's go, girls. Come on. We're going to talk about some of the women who addressed the Democratic National Convention on that first night, Monday night here in Chicago. Um, before we do, a couple of uh, other little Housekeeping notes, uh, starting with somebody on the text line talking about our discussion on Phil Donahue and uh, his impact that went, you know, beyond just a, a daily TV show, Greg. Yeah, uh, Scott uh, from Sharwood listening to WAUK texted and he said, don't forget about Phil's advocacy for AIDS awareness. And that, yeah, that was very important because when he was doing that, that was in the, the height of the epidemic in a country where the president wouldn't see, even say the word AIDS. So the fact that he used his platform to bring education and light to this subject matter, um, it's yes, it's very important. And thank you, Scott, for reminding us. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. We appreciate that very much. Uh, also wanted to mention our daily newsletter from up North news uh, is out and including, we, we talked earlier about taxing tips and the difference between what Kamala Harris would do versus what Donald Trump would do on the idea of changing how tips are taxed. There's also a story there. Uh, if you uh, are already missing the Wisconsin state fair, there are some state fair foods that you can actually order year round. And you can learn about that and more in our daily newsletter. You sign up for that over at upnorthnewswi.com. Well, as mentioned, before President Biden delivered uh, the final address last night, uh, there were plenty of, uh, of other speakers, and I wanted to focus on some of the uh, women who are especially inspirational when it came to highlighting issues, when it came to highlighting uh, you know, things about what Joe Biden has accomplished along with Kamala Harris. And one of the early speakers was Wisconsin Lieutenant Governor Sarah Rodriguez, 
who talked about the issue of health care and pointed toward her own career uh, prior to serving in the legislature and now as Wisconsin's lieutenant governor and the uh, important actions that the Biden and Harris administration have taken and the things that need to continue happening to ensure that people in Wisconsin and across the country have good health care. Before I took office, I was a registered nurse. I served in the Peace Corps at the height of HIV AIDS and in Baltimore emergency rooms at the height of the heroin and gun violence epidemics. During the COVID pandemic, Trump and Wisconsin Republicans failed to protect our health. That's why I ran for office and flipped a red district blue. Because once a nurse, always a nurse. Now Trump is promising to terminate the Affordable Care Act, meddling in personal decisions between a woman and her doctor, and threatening to slash Medicare. Vice President Harris fights for our health. She'll defend women's reproductive freedom and protect Medicare and Medicaid. Thanks to the Biden-Harris administration, Insulin is capped at $35 a month for seniors. And they negotiated down the prices of 10 more life-saving drugs like Eliquis and Jardiance for Americans on Medicare. Kamala will continue to take on Big Pharma and lower the cost of prescriptions for everyone. These are real kitchen table issues that the lieutenant governor is talking about, the things that matter to people's lives. And while there are uh, some people that will will center more on the politics of grievances, I think a lot of folks are, are thinking more about, wait, what what are you doing to make life a little easier for my health care, for my job, for things like that? Uh, that's what you heard from Sarah Rodriguez and what you'll continue to hear throughout the convention. It's about taking care of folks who are, are just – going to work and coming home and taking care of their families. And you certainly got a sense of, of who is an advocate for working men and women in this country in the speech later in the evening by New York Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who noted that sometimes, you know, people, uh, Republicans and critics, you know, taunt her saying she should go back to being a bartender. And she makes clear she would have no problem doing that because she's not afraid of hard work. But she's also looking for people who, in public office, are looking out for the people who put in a hard day's work. Because we know that Donald Trump would sell this country for a dollar if it meant lining his own pockets and greasing the palms of his Wall Street friends. And I, for one, am tired about, of hearing about how a two-bit union buster thinks of himself as more of a patriot than the woman who fights every single day to lift working people out from under the boots of greed trampling on our way of life. The truth is, Don, you cannot love this country if you only fight for the wealthy and big business. To love this country is to fight for its people especially it's working people and it's most vulnerable people and the working class. And again, that's not something that, that Donald Trump or J.D. Vance are targeting. And they won't be talking about that in their remarks today. J.D. Vance in Kenosha and uh, Donald Trump going to Michigan today with the theme of what they call safety and security. So again, we'll see more of the politics of division. Contrast that with what you're going to hear from Kamala Harris and Tim Walls at Pfizer Forum later today when they hold their rally and talk again about bringing, you know, a sense of joy back to politics, bringing a, a real pride in America back to politics. There's going to be a real difference in, in what they're all saying today that we're going to be talking about on the program tomorrow. Uh, there were, were two valedictories of sorts. Uh, there was President Biden's, of course, but in, in another time and another place, this might have been uh, the winding down of, of Hillary Clinton's second term in office. And instead, uh, in delivering her remarks to the convention, she very graciously noted that uh, she fell a little short in where she wanted to go, 
but that she understands that she and all the people that supported her have made a difference and will continue building on that difference between now and November. On her first day in court, Kamala said five words that still guide her. Kamala Harris for the people. That is something that Donald Trump will never understand. So it is no surprise, is it, that he is lying about Kamala's record. He's mocking her name and her laugh. Sounds familiar. <laughs> but we have him on the run now. No matter what the polls say, we can't let up. Uh, Tim Walls' wife, uh, Gwen, had such a, a look. Well, a lot, a lot of people in the audience had such a look watching the former Secretary of State, the former First Lady, the former Senator from New York, uh, deliver her remarks. And again, the, the thought about what, what could have been. Uh, had things gone just a little bit differently in 2016. But much like for Joe Biden, there was such a deep sense of gratitude throughout the United Center during the proceedings uh, yesterday. And then uh, finally, I wanted to play remarks from First Lady Jill Biden. Uh, they've been together for right around 50 years now. And they're, they're still such a a, a, a a mutual admiration society. They're, they're, they're the president of each other's fan club. You can't say that about every marriage, especially every public marriage, uh, but you definitely see it in the Biden family as uh, First Lady Jill Biden illustrated last night. <laughs> Joe and I have been together for almost 50 years. <laughs> and still, there are moments when I fall in love with him all over again. Like when I handed him our baby Ashley for the first time and saw the smile that lit up his face. Or on nights after an exhausting day in the, working in the Senate when he would read one more bedtime story just because the kids asked. When he stops on a rope line because he sees someone grieving who needs to know that everything is going to be all right one day. Or to encourage that child with a stutter to find the confidence she needs. Those moments when I'm reminded of all he's accomplished in the name of something bigger than himself. Receiving the Medal of Freedom with Humility. <laughs> Placing his hand on our family Bible to take his oath of office. And weeks ago, when I saw him dig deep into his soul, and decide to no longer seek re-election and endorse Kamala Harris. Just a team player all around is, you know, the impression that Jill Biden wanted to give there. I didn't, uh, I don't have an Ashley Biden clip ready, uh, their daughter, but she, she told this great story about how um, Joe Biden, then a senator from Delaware, and Ashley was eight, uh, and uh, it, was, it was her birthday. And the Senate was in session. There was something very important going on. And so, you know, daddy wouldn't be able to come home for the birthday party. And then later in the day, uh, Jill Biden, you know, got her, her daughter's jacket and said, here, put your jacket on. We're, we're going someplace. They went to the train station. Joe Biden got off one train. They lit some candles on a cake that uh, Jill had brought. They sang happy birthday. There was some hugs, some kisses, some small talk. And then he had to cross over to, to the other tracks for the train that was heading back to Washington, D.C. Uh, the man took enough time out of the day to make sure that he could get home and wish happy birthday.
to his eight year old daughter. Um, that that's that's the measure of the man that Jill and Ashley tried to talk about yesterday. Yeah, that's it's you know we can talk about politicians and you know all the but I just I'll I've said before I'll say it again. Regardless of all the things, I always feel like Joe Biden has had a, a love for people, for his country, and for American citizens, and he he has made decisions I disagree with in the past, mm-hmm. but he is a a person who loves this country deeply and works to serve it. And when he says he loves the office, I believe it. I believe he loves being president, but not for the powerful reasons, but because he can affect change, and he has, yeah. and there's right. no doubt, period. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's like Colin Joe said at the White House Correspondents Dinner. Uh, he said that his his uh, father, I think it was, just pointed out he's he's just a good man. Yeah. And Lord knows we don't have enough of that. And I'll, I'll close by mentioning that I'll be putting up a story on our website, upnorthnewswi.com, a, a little later today uh, that I was working on last night about labor leaders, uh, the heads of six unions also spoke last night at the Democratic National Convention uh, to list the many ways that the Biden-Harris team has had workers' backs and how Trump has been hostile to workers' rights and prosperity. There was Liz uh, Schuler from the, uh, she's the president of the AFL-CIO, 13 million U.S. workers. And she said, this election is about two economic visions. Trump's is a CEO's dream, but a worker's nightmare. Whereas Biden and Harris have a vision of an opportunity economy where you work to lower the cost of groceries and prescriptions and housing. Uh, You had Sean Fain of the United Auto Workers Union talking about uh, corporate greed, which is a source of inflation. It hurts workers. It hurts consumers. And noted that Trump has uh, has been seeking to divide frustrated workers by trying to blame minorities and the LGBTQ community and immigrants and anyone else that will distract from corporate price gouging and wage theft that goes on. Uh, The leader of AFSCME, Lee Saunders, said four years ago we faced a pandemic and a recession with a president who didn't care one bit about what working people were going through, but that things improved quickly once Biden and Harris took over and helped pass the American Rescue Plan. There was plenty of talk from the laborers and the communication workers about infrastructure and from SEIU about the care economy that's growing out there. So working men and women, especially those in organized labor, understand who's been working and looking out for them and who would again in the next four years. Chad Holmes is next. You're up north. Well, that would be Chad Holmes' music, and that's normally where Chad Holmes would then come into play. And then then I start wondering to myself, okay, is Chad running a little late? Or did I not send uh, the proper link to him? And I don't have time to look it up. So I, I'm going to stand on this one and say, I did it. I did my part. I did. Chad fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> that's my accusation right there. Chad stayed up for the whole thing and then and then drifted off. <laughs> or he's sitting in his Wausau studio right now going, hey, Kreitlow. Where's the link? <laughs> I can't knock on the door without you. So we'll, we'll see. We'll see how that, how that oh, works Oh, look what I him. got here. It's a message from Chad Holmes saying, Greg, I don't have the link. <laughs> Jeez. The mystery is solved. Patrick was inside uh, the house the whole time. I, I don't know. I, I don't know. <laughs> oh, okay, President Trump. What? Uh, I'm sorry. What? All right, let me. I hear him knocking on the door. There let me is. let me let him in. Let me, <laughs> because I got the same note from Terry Bell the other day. I sent the the link so early. You know, I sent it oh, on like Friday. Now, now that I recall, I do recall seeing oh, something back. Let oh, me go back. Oh, let the, me go the, back. Oh, yeah. The witnesses excuse. <laughs> There See, it is. There okay, it is. that is as much an indictment of me as it is of you. <laughs> that 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 people are surprised that I got my work done early. No, no, no. That's, oh God, it's it's my fault for running around and oh, we gotta get it here. This is the most the Midwestern confrontation ever. Oh, that yeah, that was my fault. Nope, I got it. No, oh, it's fine. I was doing right. something. I did, but oh, let me just sneak past you. Oh, <laughs> you couldn't be more correct on that. Oh, uh, Mr. Holmes, did you did you stay up for all of it? I did. Oh, it was. Uh, you know, it was. Uh, it was a really good first night, generally, and uh, the thing that you know, obviously, uh, 
uh, the, I thought the president did a, a wonderful job. I thought, you know, again, he showed that he's a big man. <laughs> I yep. mean, he 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 teed it up very nicely for the rest of the week uh, for the vice president and Tim Walls. And I also, something that was mentioned by one of the commentators, uh, I was watching PBS, and the thing that was very different between this this convention so far and what we saw in Milwaukee a couple of weeks ago is that uh, the folks who came up were not afraid to say, hey, Democrats, we're proud to be Democrats. Yes. The Republican Party doesn't even mention, hey, Republicans, no, it, it, it's the Trump Party. And there's something I think that in the tradition of the American system here, I think that's rather significant. I will tell you that uh, this actually goes back to 1988. And I have never truly forgiven Michael Dukakis for the way that he ran his campaign, that when George H.W. Bush, I mean, all you heard throughout the entire campaign was Dukakis is a liberal. He's a liberal, liberal this and a liberal that. And at no point was there this forceful defense of you're damn right. I'm a liberal. And here's why it was the, Oh, you know, the tack toward the center what the, you know, the consultants all tell you to do. And, you know, part of the reason you hear the word progressive so often you didn't, when we were younger, people were looking for something to say other than the word liberal, you know, and now you have Democrats who are saying they're actually putting Democrat on their yard signs. Now, you know, they're saying, the, the the Democratic Party in their remarks when they're talking to people. And by the way, the other thing they're saying is is they're they're the ones putting the flag on some of their material and talking about the pride that they take in being American. Because I think they see in well, they see in Donald Trump nothing but this doom and gloom. America's heading toward a, another depression. America is heading toward World War Three. Said both of those things, you know, over the weekend as well. And the rest of us are looking around going, Actually, we're we're a pretty good spot here when you put good people in in good offices, and also, and again, I think you hit it on the head. It, it you need to talk about the differentiation with within issues, and and to show that we are not all on the same hymn sheet. If you listen to our radio stations during the course of the day, yesterday I was at my desk, and during Todd's show, he had uh, Trigby Olson on, and Trigby again, I respect him greatly, but at the same time, I was getting a little annoyed because he was talking about how. He was so impressed with Tim Walls when he talked to the high school football team the other day because he wasn't talking about issues. Well, that was a different situation, and that the idea that Democrats really need to stop stop getting bogged down on issues all the time and talk more along the along the line of, of telling this narrative. I thought, I mean, come on, this is too important. We need to talk about issues. I understand the idea of having a good narrative and being able to connect with people, but I mean, when you talk about uh, the idea of the Democratic Party and the Republican Party or the Democrat. Democratic Party and the Trump Party, there are a lot of uh, issues that, frankly, don't get talked about enough. And I think that's probably one of the frustrations for President Biden is, again, he mentioned it last night that, you know, in the first two years, very, very narrow majorities in both houses, and yet they got something done. And there is a record. And I do think that the Democratic Party needs to talk about the, the you, I think you used the term of uh, kitchen table issues earlier yeah. in the program. I don't understand how Republicans get away with the fact that uh, they push back against uh, the insulin cap. They push back against junk fees. They push back against airlines being able to add all these these secret charges when you you go through checkout. They 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 say no, those are bad things. The president has done so many. I would I, I hate to use the term little things, but they are in terms of uh, you know a few dollars here, a few dollars there that we do need to talk about, and I hope that get reported on more but it just hasn't and and then the fact that they say oh that's not important well it is important for people who count every dollar when they go on a vacation when they go to the airport and things like that so no i was very happy to see the president take the time to go over the accomplishments the things that he was able to get done with the help of the democratic congress those first two years uh, last night yeah. No, those, those little things, you know, do matter because otherwise folks feel like they've been looked over, you know, or overlooked. They feel like they're in flyover land that you've got in the case of Republicans in the Wisconsin legislature and in Congress, the main thing they want to do is lower taxes in that top income tax bracket. You know, a massive amount of people there rather than doing the things that make life a little easier for the rest of us, you know, in the middle class. Yes. And, and, and really 
what what in the Republican platform or what Trump has been talking about is directly towards the economic well-being of the middle class. It's all about social. It's all about grievance. They don't have specifics on how to make the middle class more successful. The numbers are there, what Joe Biden's been able to do in terms of take-home pay. And he was so and he's so right to be able to say, I am one of the best presidents for unions because unions do build this country. So, again, I do think issues along with everything else, need to be at the forefront of this campaign. Absolutely. Chad Holmes will pick up the conversation on Bull Falls Radio. You can listen in the Wausau area or anywhere else across the Civic Media Radio Network through the Civic Media app. Thank you, Chad. Have a great day. You too, guys. All right. Uh, Greg, back from Matinee on Air. Two little hours from now. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks for uh, everybody with their patience as we carry on, as we get going and uh, have a busy week here in Chicago. Up North News is the Wisconsin outlet for Courier, a uh, pro-democracy news network building a more informed, engaged, and representative America. I'm Pat Kreitlow. Have a great day. We'll see you tomorrow morning from Chicago.